Welcome to the FT On Air from the Financial Times in London. What are we to expect from the Donald Trump presidency, in particular in matters economic? Martin Wolf, our chief economics commentator, is here to discuss this with me. I'm Martin Sanbu, an economics writer here. Uh, Martin, I'll, I'll start by just taking, you know, admitting that I got it a bit wrong. I expected the mother of all stock market crashes when, if Trump were elected. That didn't happen. Instead, we had a bond market crash while stocks sort of went up. That sort of illustrates maybe um, something that seems to be coming out of the budding Trump administration on what they want to do in economics. There's talk of a shift from low interest rate and monetary policy towards more fiscal policy, fiscal stimulus, infrastructure spending, tax cuts. And it strikes me that this is actually what a lot of left-leaning economists were calling for. Be careful what you wish for, maybe they didn't want Trump to deliver that. But is that what he's going to deliver? And if so, what should we expect for the US domestic economy from that sort of program? Well, the big thing that I suppose they, as you say, left-leaning economists, like Larry Summers will be a very good example. Paul Krugman, this, maybe. Uh, Paul Krugman and so forth. They viewed uh, spending, particularly on infrastructure, as a, uh, as a very sensible thing to do. And I agree. I think it is very sensible. The US has a desperate need for more spending on infrastructure. It would have a high return. Many investments could have a high return. And the real interest rates still are pretty low. Even if, and even at the post-Trump bounce, real interest rates are still very, very low. So why not borrow? How much he will do, whether it will be high priority investment, whether he is going to stick with this sort of idea of private funding, which limits what they can do, none of that's really clear. But this is something I think many of us will strongly support. Unfortunately, this does go along with what is likely to be the more important part of the package, which is huge, and it apparently appears um, permanent tax cuts, um, possibly in the neighborhood of 3% of GDP or so, um, in a country that already has quite a sizable fiscal deficit. That's not sustainable without really big permanent cuts in spending. And I suspect that would then become the issue that would be very worrying and disturbing. But the infrastructure side looks actually rather good. On the tax cuts, actually, uh, I guess one counter argument, one worry about this Trump program is that tax cut for the highest income people is a pretty inefficient way of stimulating demand because they tend to save more of their money than poorer people do. And on infrastructure, the, the point you mentioned, if this is done through tax credits for private infrastructure spending, it might not be the most needed or most powerful uh, infrastructure spending for demand stimulus. So it's something that somebody like Mr. Trump himself could call low energy stimulus. Yes. Um, we are getting some questions in. Please do send them. Uh, I will read them out from my iPad here. Um, but before I get to that, I also want to talk a little bit about the international side of this. The U.S. is the largest economy in the world. What happens in U.S. economic policy decisions domestically can have tremendous impact elsewhere. What is your best guess at what, how the rest of the world economy uh, might respond to, uh, to Trumponomics? Well, you've raised a very fundamental question already, which is how big overall will be the impact on spending in the U.S.? As you say, tax cuts for rich people probably just will mostly go into higher savings or a lot will go into higher savings. It won't affect spending, won't affect demand. And of course, if the infrastructure spending comes along very slowly, uh, these things always take time, uh, particularly if you've got this complexity of getting it privately done, maybe the spending implications will be quite small, in which case there won't be much boost and the international and domestic effects will be quite modest. But think of the alternative, that it's big enough that it really starts getting domestic spending going. Then the standard assumption would be, and I think it's realistic, unless the Fed, the Federal Reserve is forced to do something different, the Fed would raise interest rates faster than otherwise. Uh, Long-term interest rates would also rise faster than otherwise because people expect permanently larger fiscal deficits, more spending, more inflationary pressure, therefore higher short-term interest rates. That will tend to strengthen the dollar. One of the ways that the excess demand in the U.S. economy with this additional spending, which seems to be sort of maybe close-ish to full employment, very controversial, but maybe it's certainly closer than it was eight years ago or seven years ago. So that will uh, increase the external deficit, and the way to do, because 
resources will come into the country from abroad, and that will be facilitated by a stronger dollar. And the strengthening of the dollar will have a, quite a range of uh, implications for countries. Uh, economies whose exchange rates will depreciate against the dollar are export-oriented economies, maybe China, maybe Japan, maybe the Eurozone, particularly Germany, will benefit. Countries that are very large net uh, uh, debtors in dollars, uh, uh, particularly which have companies which are heavy net debtors in dollars, where the interest rates are going up right. and the dollar are going up, probably a lot of emerging economies, you could have a lot of bad debt. So that this we, is how many crises That is exactly what I mean. I made the comparison in my column this week 95. with the early 80s when right. we had the Volcker combination of the Reagan fiscal boost and the Volcker interest rates, which is very extreme, and that led directly to the debt crisis of in, 82. In America, yes. yes. So we are worried that that sort of thing, not to the same degree, might happen again. And as you pointed out in your in your column this week, a, high, a stronger dollar probably wouldn't help those people Trump was elected to help. The, Certainly the not. Kind of, uh, it, would kill, manufacturing it, would, class. it would hit manufacturing he wants to help. There are several co questions coming in from you uh, viewers about about the deficit and the sort of politics of it. Uh, so one person asks, you know, will the deficits become bigger and bigger in order to keep this going? Will we see increasing deficits? Uh, and another question about the political economy of this. Will Paul Ryan, the House of Representatives speaker, Republican speaker, will he suddenly stop caring about this now? Because he's profiled himself as a fiscal hawk. So how do you see the political economy of this playing out? This is, I think, absolutely fascinating because, it, in a sense, we've sort of got two Republican parties now. There's the presidential party, yes. which is in some ways quite Keynesian, doesn't seem to care about fiscal deficits. Uh, and we've got the congressional party, which likes tax cuts but wants to slash spending. Uh, I'm going to, I assumed in my column that if you look at the initial impact of the Trump program on the present baseline, what what the, the, uh, the this administration is projecting, you get to fiscal deficits running in the neighborhood of five and a half percent of GDP, uh, even without the infrastructure spending, right. uh, which will be over and above that. So maybe we're talking about six and a half percent of GDP in an economy running at full employment. That implies an explosive increase in debt. Real interest rates are going to rise too, probably, and nominal interest too. So it could really be quite explosive. I cannot imagine Mr. Ryan will be happy about this. But Mr. Ryan will like the tax cut. So I think what he will want is to slash spending. Now, if you look at the structure of American federal spending, which I did, uh, you find that to slash spending on that, this sort of magnitude right. may be, let's talk, 4% of GDP. So let's suppose he wanted to cut. That's just an arbitrary number. It will close most of the additional deficit, or maybe all. Uh, four percent of GDP could he could not get that without uh, slashing entitlement programs or very fundamental income support programs. You can't get it out of other aspects, bits of the budget because they're just too small. Uh, the right. the core components are so large. So then you've got immensely complex politics because Mr. Trump has said, "I want to keep." Medicare. I want to keep most of the healthcare spending, not perhaps Obamacare, but that's not the biggest item. So who knows who wins? Is it the Trump party or the Ryan party? It's clearly going to be politically very difficult once you start cutting into entitlements for, for the elderly, for example, big voting population. We sit in the UK. Uh, one view, Apprentice Baines, is asking what effect would a rising interest rate in the US have on interest rates in the UK? I think that's a very, very good question. Uh, I think that we could probably avoid raising short rates, um, except to the extent, and that's the really big question. Let's suppose the dollar goes up so much more against the pound, uh, and let's assume that as the pound falls, other currencies tend to, we also fall in against other currencies a lot, depends on what happens with the euro, so this is very yes. complicated. But you could imagine the inflation shock we already have from Brexit will get bigger. Would the Bank of England be prepared to ignore that? It might get very difficult to do if inflation really rose a lot. But I suspect the impact via inflation of a dollar rise alone is probably manageable. There are also questions about what happens with oil prices. If it's manageable, the Bank of England can ignore it, I think. But longer rates, I would suspect, would go up in there's historically tended to be quite a close correlation between bond yields, not perfect, bond yields here in the U.S. And if bond yields in the U.S. went up significantly, I would expect our longer end yields to rise, essentially on the expectation the world economy is going to be stronger, real interest rates will be stronger, because the U.S. is doing this huge shift. We're moving out of secular stagnation, and that will affect our long rates, and that will create 
some real implications. And for I us. think I think these comments actually apply much more broadly, not just to the UK. They apply broadly. The question you asked about, and, and we see and probably an increased link between credit conditions and, and interest rate cycles between all the big economies, not just the emerging markets, yes. but it might apply to the euro That's a as very well. important point. Floating rates don't insulate you completely from at all from monetary and financial conditions in really important economies. And as you pointed out earlier, the US is, remains today, the single most important economy in the world. Now let's move to trade, where of course there was some pretty incendiary rhetoric from candidate Trump. Uh, one questioner asked how a Trump administration would affect trade between the USA and the UK. President Obama, of course, said the UK would be back of the queue after leaving the EU. Very different noises from uh, President-elect Trump and his team. What do you see happen? And maybe we can also talk more broadly about the outlook for global trade with the Trump administration. Well, let's start with the UK end. Um, we still don't know what's going to happen with Brexit. And we won't have a trade policy of our own until we have left the EU Customs Union. Right. As long as we're in the Customs Union, we don't have freedom. If you assume, so let me just assume that we will leave the customs union and therefore we can form trade deals with other countries, I think the Trump, uh, uh, if you, the Trump election, if you know all the other things we've been talking about and will be talking about, is good for British trade. I suspect that one of the few countries Mr. Trump is going to rather like will be conservative Britain. He seems to be think of it as not, it's not like China or Mexico, as it were, in his bad boy list. Right. And, uh, and certainly there are people in our government um, who are very hopeful that this will allow us to jump to the head of the queue and we can do a trade deal with the US, while he's really not very keen on doing a trade deal with Europe. And anyway, the, the TTIP, the deal that was being discussed, looks sort of impossible. The there US, is a down... The US-EU Yes, deal. the US-EU yes. deal. So we get, there is a problem with that, is if you've got a trade negotiation between Little Britain and the US, yeah, we're the fifth largest economy, but the U.S. is sixth six, now. I think, after the fall six, of yes. So six, the U.S. is six or seven times as big. The, we'll have to take American terms, yes. and some of the terms we might have to take, particularly in areas like so so controversial issues, investor state dispute settlement, in intellectual property, in health, might be very controversial in Britain. So we right. could get the deal, but it will be on their terms. More broadly, I think everybody is drawing in their breath. We mm. don't know. It, we think that well, TTIP that is dead. You've said we think that he's he'd be very clear right. that TTIP I think was already dead mm -hmm. because the Germans already have shown that they don't really want to do it. And if the Germans don't want to do a trade deal, the EU can't do a trade deal. That's the indicator. Right. The domestic politics are bad. The big one that I think there's the what happens to NAFTA, right? Uh, which is a very important deal for so Mexico, Mexico and Canada, and Canada yes. with the US. Is he really going to cancel that, which he's indicated he will, and what will he replace it with? These are really important relationships. And the second really big one is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was agreed, hasn't been ratified, was a major yeah. achievement of the Obama administration. The, the, the 12 countries involved are include very important Asian allies like Japan and Korea. If he just scraps it, forgets about it, what will these countries say? Well, they will probably say, well, perhaps the only thing that's gone is go what's called the RCEP, which is which is a deal with China. Right. And that's a big strategic issue. Does America really stand back and say, OK, Japan, Korea, form closer relations with China. We're not going to be part of this. That will be a big strategic move. Un unimaginable almost. But, but, but this would certainly affect both geopolitics and the future of world trade. So. And this geopolitical dimension was very much huge the rationale for TPP to indeed. begin with. So the question of how Mr. Trump will deal in the end when he actually isn't responsible, not outside, with these huge questions of geopolitics with important allies, as well as the future trade system, is he really going to let it go? Even though, remember, the Brit American firms... Um, who are very important supporters of the Republican Party, uh, major entities, enterprise, have immense investments in Asia. They are involved in trade there, and they won't want to see all this cut off with protectionism. Uh, th there's another question about the UK and, and trade with the US. Um, somebody has caught on to this mention that maybe the UK could join in on NAFTA renegotiation talks. Is that at all a realistic prospect? 
Well, I suspect anything is realistic in this brand new world. <laughs> yes. I mean, if Mr. Trump were to say, we're going to form a new free trade area of like-minded countries, which we, you know, who, which, whom we trust. Let's suppose he were to say, well, I don't want to do a trade deal with Mexico. I want to do a trade deal with Canada and in the, the UK, UK, you yeah. know, like-minded English-speaking developed countries, and maybe we'll throw in Australia. We'll scrap TPP and have Australia. Who, New Zealand, who knows? This is uh, the sort of thing some of the Brexiters yeah, had in the mind. The Anglosphere is yeah. one of the, uh, the the geopolitical ideas of Brexiters. I think there will be people in the uh, Trump camp with a rather historic view of English-speaking nations sort of thing, very uh, rather reactionary views on actually on ethnicity in America would probably think that was quite appropriate. But nobody knows. Nobody knows who's going to be in charge of trade policy yet. We don't know who the the Treasury Secretary or the U.S. Trade Representative will be. We don't know any of these things. Everything seems to me to be up for grabs now. And in the, uh, in the, in the vacuum, you see it's very interesting. China has already sort of sent out invitations to uh, spurn TPP partners to pursue, exactly. as you hinted at, a yeah. free trade deal the, with, with China. Uh, so uh, Regional Cooperation, exactly. uh, he, he, I can't remember, RCEP is the, is the, uh, the acronyms. Yes, China would certainly see uh, the the uh, uh, the emergence of an America who's a fundamentally unreliable ally, and remember, there's also the geopolitics. Mr. Trump has already suggested to Korea and Japan that maybe the defense umbrella from the United States is also going to be withdrawn. So the the trade deal doesn't work. The defense umbrella is going to be withdrawn. Well, if that happens, I very much hope not. But if that were to happen, these countries would have to say, how do we secure our stability? Well, one way is we arm ourselves to the teeth. But the alternative, which might well be much more attractive, is let's accommodate emerging Chinese hegemony. At least China we have problems with it, but it's sort of stable. It doesn't change its whole policy from one second to the next. We know what we're dealing with, and that will be a massive strategic shift of enormous proportions. Well, Prime Minister Abe of Japan is meeting Mr. Trump today as the first foreign leader in office. To, I'm sure to, he to will be him. pointing all this out. Very interesting to see what comes out. I'm of sure that. he will be saying this. We have time for one last question, which returns to this fiscal monetary policy mix question. Uh, so Stuart Wood asks, uh, do increases in guilt yields, and we can broaden this out to government bond yields all over, they raise the cost of government borrowing. So isn't that going to actually make it harder uh, for governments to stimulate? If you now see, we've seen a fall in bond prices, so that's a rise in yields, rise in borrowing costs already. Uh, isn't the reaction in capital markets actually going to make it harder for governments to stimulate their economies? There's no doubt that uh, because we're now doing it so late, when in many cases we sort of moved back towards full employment and uh, certainly the UK and the US were closer to it. So monetary policy is more likely to tighten and, and guilt yields and bond yields for that reason are likely to rise. This makes it pretty badly timed. Uh, you know, if we were going to do this, we should have done it six or seven years ago. But the question, of course, in terms of how much we can do depends on how much they rise. If bond yields, uh, let's say nominal bond yields, uh, over 10 years go maybe say 3%, uh, real interest rate is 1%. That's higher than they've been, uh, but perfectly manageable as long as the deficits are contained and one-off in the sense you're doing for borrowing right. for high... Pro if you're borrowing for uh, infrastructure, which has a high long-term economic and social return, not necessarily monetary, I think that's perfectly manageable. Uh, if, of course, they Just went for to... permanent tax cuts, uh, that's a different matter. Yeah, permanent tax cuts become a very different matter, uh, and that's why I think spending would have to be slashed. And, of course, if interest rates went to 5% or mm. 6%, which, of course, have happened, so real interest rates go to 3 or 4%, which I wouldn't forecast at all with these changes. They would have to be much bigger. But if we saw that, then, of course, fiscal crises will be where we will be in. I mean, we will begin to have explosive, really explosive debt profiles, and countries all around the developed world will find themselves forced to slash uh, deficits very, very significantly, and we would have shifted into a fiscal crisis world. At the moment, that doesn't seem likely from what we've seen, but it depends what happens. If the U.S. really does move to a, a structural fiscal deficit of 6 or 7 percent, you know, with... Uh, and shows no sign of doing anything about it, nothing, um, then I think the bond markets become really, really dangerous. And we could shift quite quickly, unfortunately, into quite worrying fiscal conditions.
These are big and difficult questions that we could keep talking about for a long time. Our time is up for now. So thank you very much, Martin Wolf, for joining me in this discussion. Thanks to all of you for watching, and we hope to see you again soon.